Yeah. So anyway, so everybody is aware. We'll move past that. But yes, pickleball is like actually driving up like massive amounts of elderly injuries in this country. <laughs> It seems like an oddity because I've seen videos of people playing pickleball and I don't understand how like the elderly would get driven into the specific sport. <laughs> it was originally uh, for kids. It was like the, the history of pickleball is like it was like a lake house sort of thing. Some dude cre like they came up with it um, on like Bainsbridge Island in Washington. But, but back in the 60s, it's been around for a while. Um, okay. But. But like, yeah, it, it is like it's been like a thing for a long time. But yeah, it was like this sort of like summer kids lake house sort of vibe. Like, what can we throw together? Right. We just need like a plastic ball, a couple of plastic paddles and like, you know, any sort of space will do. But a tennis court will work. Right. So something like lawn darts, but a little bit less darty. Yes, it, it is very much one of those sort of white people summer home sports. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that Yeah, because when I saw the videos of this, I completely understood this is completely uh, one of those white niche sports for sure. Yes. Um, and uh, if you do stick around for Bad Movie Night, which um, you're welcome to join us. It isn't on Twitch. We move over to we move over to kick for that. Um, OK. But um, we um, we absolutely will be will be on Discord as well. Um, but there is a black couple in the movie, and they even say, uh, "I don't know if you're familiar with Donald James Parker. He is a piece of work." But they actually look at him and go, we're, "Well, we're surprised that like you know, like uh, the black couple says we're surprised that we'd be welcome here." <laughs> 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 that's crazy um yeah, yeah you know i have a lot of black friends that um like so i used to live in a, um the south side of chicago and it's very much predominantly black over there especially with the culture even mixing into like like white neighborhoods which there are plenty of right um it, it is kind of weird that how these white things will actually bleed into like the black communities and when i when i bring it up like dude that's totally a white thing like my black friends should be like are you serious like lawn darts like i've seen them play lawn darts like in their backyard and i like had to yeah, mention it's like, quintessential dude. 1950s <laughs> suburbia <laughs> right but i don't think they kind of like i i think it's sort of like i don't want to say like missed by them uh maybe it just hasn't been represented in that way maybe it's kind of like their parents had it and they utilized yeah. them during like family outings yeah, or it's whatever. just and been it adopted into yeah. culture and there's cross pollination within cultures and at a certain point it gets lost to a certain point where you know subsequent generations aren't aware of it that it's like yes, oh that's where right, that comes right. from Is yeah so when i had to mention that they're just like get the fuck out of here and i'm like yeah no i mean it's it's not that it should be something specifically racial at it's, all. It's, it's like Mad Men territory. Yeah. It's 1950s. Yeah, sure. Dad's drunk in the backyard. Fucking <laughs> like. That's exactly it. Yeah. Horseshoes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, no, yeah. Pickleball is a hundred percent like the lake lake cottage, uh, white people sort of sport. It it like it was out at uh, Bainbridge, Bainbridge uh, Island up in Washington, and it was a hundred percent a summer home that it was created at. And so, oh, yeah, I could totally see that. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, yeah, it, it was, like, it's one of those sports. Um, and, yeah, it is absolutely responsible for, like, estimated, we'll see at the end of the year, but they are on track to hit it at, at present. It could potentially hit a half a billion dollars worth of emergency room visits and subsequent care. So my question is, who thought this would be great to bring up to the elderly, given that you have to have some sort of mobility to play this, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, apparently it was COVID. Oh shit. The excuse for everything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a controversial statement, but I, yeah. COVID, so, COVID okay. drew, um, it, the, it basically, it created a, a situation in which, um, people were seeking alternatives to indoor sport activities. Copy that. And, and that's the one they chose. Yes. Lawn darts was safer. Um, be, functionally, if you look at the, okay, so who took, who picked it up? Boomers, right? Mm -hmm. Boomers. What do you play it on? A converted tennis court. Right. Oh, 
Okay, yeah, it does. It does track. Go ahead. Yes. So it is. It is a predominantly white sport created by people and uh, white people in the '60s at a summer cottage up on a Washington uh, Washington State Island, up on Bainbridge Island, and during a uh, during a lockdown. Um, they, um, they sought outdoor sports. So, uh, so indoor contamination didn't occur, occur so readily. So, uh, it was in the sun, got them out, got them socializing and you can play it on tennis courts. So all the country clubs pick it up, picked it up. All of the people who have access to tennis courts, which are traditionally suburban white people and boomers who have the time to be on the tennis courts during that. There you go. All of a sudden you have this massive surge of boomers playing pickleball. <laughs> yeah i've seen these videos of people playing pickleball and i guess it's more like the uh i don't want to say professional but i guess there is a professional element to it right and it does seem pretty mobile i mean they get pretty close when they want to like get close and kind of like fake people out um it can be it, does, it can be played I mean, I at a high a high level of athleticism right but i guess you do have that six foot rule which does you know cor correlate with that right with the uh the covid rules at yeah that point. and swede who Definitely is in territory where that would be. Um, Swede said half of the courts in my hometown have been converted and they're constantly packed. Wow, that's insane. I, dude, I've seen videos here and there, and I thought, like, I still think it's a pretty niche sport to say anything about it, right? So, with that comment like being made, I, I kind of wonder, like, how much, like, like how, how much ground this is being, like, has been picked up, or like, specifically, like, where in the United States it has been gaining ground. I mean, where I'm at in the, in the Middle East, yeah, absolutely not. Nobody's probably heard of this. What did I say, Middle East? Yes, you like, did. Yeah, you, you get my point. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I mean, like it, Center it, East Coast or Midwest? Midwest. Sorry. Okay, yeah, you're thank still. You. <laughs> I was, was going to say, are you still in Chicago? So we're Midwest, or <laughs> you know I did do a little traveling, but not that far. Okay. Um, uh, but yeah, oh, that's nonsense. Weird, tennis courts. Nonsense. Ahead, who is in Nebraska? Um. Is I I always want to put you in Kansas for some reason nonsense or is it Kansas Kansas I fucking I'm sorry I forget I at this point Nebraska and Kansas are just occupying the same space in my head for some reason and I don't know why you're from Kansas and he's saying it's huge here more mainstream than golf by a long way now more mainstream than golf. Yeah. Oh wow. Sweet that's, is that's... the Nebraskan, which I know that. Sweet, I know you're in. I know where you are in Nebraska and why you're where you are in Nebraska. But for some reason, I cannot hold nonsense as Kansas in my head. <laughs> um, fucking uh, Garrick, thank you. Actually, the same place. Um, <laughs> fucking. <it. laughs> um, so like, um, also, it's been. It's now a growth industry. So, like, once that initial kick happened, um, you saw the potentiation of financier, right? Um, LeBron James and Drew Bees um, invested heavily into it. Um, the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Gary, I can't even begin to pronounce his last name. Um, he's uh, in, he's an op entrepreneur investment guy. Um, made huge investments into quote unquote professional pickleball teams. Dude, check this out. I just did a Google search about uh, pickleball popularity. Uh, has exploded in popularity in Vayner recent Chuck, years. I think. As of twenty twenty two, has eight point nine million players. So that means recorded players at some point they're on like teams that are being recorded not just like casual players in their backyard yeah Holy yeah shit. um oh is is, is vayner chuck the douchebag that said he he wants the like workers to suffer is it that douchebag it feels like it's that douchebag somebody can like have no him. context behind that <laughs> um oh he he um dude uh um, Should I even said anything? Sorry. He um he very recently um on the record in an interview with cameras facing him recording video, um mm. he said um hold on I'll just gear yeah it. verbatim it yeah, yeah you can oh no 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 uh, Swede um thank you cupcake. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, is it America or globally? Hang on. Let me oh, that was further. Tim Gurner, not Gary Vanerchuk. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Different, different, different financier douchebags. 
Um, but uh, Tim Gurner um, said it, what I was referencing. Uh, we need to see unemployment rise. Unemployment has to jump to 40, 50 percent in my view. We need to see pain in the economy. We need to remind people that they work for the employer, not the other way around. Amen. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that response? So. <sighs> So I have a mixed feeling about, okay, so maybe, okay, so maybe I shouldn't have done two things at once, right? Um, so reiterate what you said so I could have a better specific like evaluation of what you said, because I feel like I might have uh, stated something incorrect, <clears throat> if we, you understand what I mean. We need, to see, we need to see unemployment rise. Unemployment has to jump 40, 50% in yep. my view. We need to see pain in the economy. We need to remind people that they work for the employer, not the other way around. Yep, definitely misheard that. Okay, good thing I, yeah, definitely asked you about that. So that statement comes with certain conclusions that I can only assume. And those, oh, Oh, it's during a, it's a long interview too. It's it is far out of not even close to out uh, out of uh, out of context. There's been a systemic change where employees feel the employer is lucky to have them, as opposed to the other way around. We've got to kill that attitude, and that has to come through hurting the economy. Governments around the world are trying to increase unemployment to get some of that normality. We're starting to see less arrogance in the employment market, and that has to continue. This went on for many minutes. Less arrogance. I, I kind of disagree with that because a lot of videos that I see about like quiet, um, quiet quitting and shit like that do employ some sort of arrogance within like choosing what they do as far as employment. Right. Uh, does that not like have something to do with employment? Because I mean, there, there is some like arrogance within like choosing whether or not you keep a job. Um, I feel like that has a lot to do with uh, with this topic specifically. I'm just going to you right now just point it's out of focus because of the bokeh on my camera but over my left oh, shoulder I, at all times is a sign that says labor creates all wealth if you don't yeah, have but the, that's undeniable too right well but that's what he fails to acknowledge which is why i kind of like i i started to make a comment that i chose to sort of like taper off and sort of like think about exactly why he would come to those conclusions that I'm because he's busy. because he's a yeah. very wealthy man I guess that makes the point yes yes this, and how would how, yeah how would he possibly see it within like say the laborers perspective yeah it, it again this is why people shouldn't be allowed to be that wealthy frankly it's just the reality of the situation it's like letting okay let me very quickly right why are dictators bad in government, but dictators are good in business when business runs half of the world as we know it? Mm. Right? If, if, if giving a singular person that kind of, or group of people even, right? Like oligarchs, right? If giving a single or small group of people that kind of power is universally recognized through governance as a bad idea, it leads to all sorts of crazy shit that inevitably is bad for humanity in the short, mid, and long term, right? We just get that. We're like, yeah, you know, democracy, flaws, blah, 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 but it's better than some autocratic psycho dictator who decides that, like, my son shall be the king of women now, and all of your wives <laughs> are his property because I say so, right? right? It's better to have... It, the power distributed through as many hands as you possibly can, that way, ultimately, you have sort of many checks and balances on that, like, out of control, out of, you know, out of cycle power base, right? But when we talk about economics, when we talk about business, when we talk about private industry, all of a sudden, everybody who's like, yay democracy, yay fucking republic, yay parliamentary systems, are all of a sudden flip on a dime, and they're like, yay autocrats, why is a portion of our life, a good portion, right? Eight hours a day, arguably a, for if you're lucky, if you're lucky, right? A sincerely significant portion of your life, one third or more, and arguably a massive influence on this world, arguably more so than governance. 
why is why are dictators good there? Why is there not democracy in the workplace? Because we see what happens when these nut jobs run amok. We see what happens when CEOs decide that they, it's like, yeah, what's his fucking look at the Walmart crew, right? Look at the Walmart crew. They're worth how much money? Meanwhile, we're subsidizing their workers because they don't pay them shit. They're all on food stamps. So they're socializing their cost over to us. Right. The democracy in the workplace would mean a shift in power, which is what owners do not want. Mm hmm. Which, which again, which is why, you know, you have sort of uh, uh, the sort of par uh, 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 legislative capture that occurs, right? You have the regulatory capture that occurs. The businesses, owners, the owner class, right? As Carlin would have said, the owners of this country, right? The owners spend billions mm. ensuring you don't have that. The owners is a specific word that I really hate, but yeah, don't continue. I just want to add that. I mean, they own it. Like if yeah. if, if ownership it's, is a if ownership represents control, then they own it. I guess that's fair, right? If you own it, your land, it isn't what it is. Yeah, then you get you have say, right? You, it's your word that matters, not someone else's. That's functional right. ownership, whether it's on the paperwork or not. You know, we know who's in charge. So, like, yeah, it, it is about the democratization of the workplace. Like, that's the next big thing. And douchebags like this Gurner motherfucker, right? Like, say, he went full mask off for a moment, right? He went full mask off, and he's like, yeah, just like the Hollywood executive who said, like, our goal is to break them, uh, to make them homeless. And then they'll, like, you know, come crawling back to us. Right? It's that level. The cruelty is the point. The cruelty is the point. And when you say mask off, it's not just mask off for him. He's kind of utilizing mask off for a majority of, say, uh, wealthy business owners. Oh, right? yeah. No, uh, the, the wealthy have class consciousness. They have it. Oh, for sure. Like, we see it. it. It bleeds out of them. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. What's good, as, as Carlin once infamously said, on a, a back when uh, Bill Maher's show was mildly tolerable, only because Carl, <laughs> only because Car the likes of Carlin were still on it, right? Um, right. When that douchebag next to him said some stupid shit, and Carlin said, you know, um, he said, you don't need a uh, no. Actually, that would have been ABC. You don't need a formal conspiracy when like interests converge. It's what's good for me is good for you. Simple as that. It really isn't that complicated. You don't need a shadowy board somewhere fucking actually like saying, okay, tomorrow we shall do this because you as a, as a hundred millionaire, me as a hundred millionaire, that dude is a billionaire. That dude is a billionaire. We all own shit. We all own stocks. We all own companies. We all have laborers that whose, uh, whose labor value we steal from, Right. So the disempowerment of that in some fashion legislatively benefits all of us. So if I go do that, I know it's good for you. Your pocketbook grows because I bought that senator. We know that. We don't even need to talk about it. Mm. <laughs> you don't need a formal conspiracy when like interests converge, which is functionally class consciousness, understanding that our, like, uh, our interests align and that we should work within those. The wealthy always have class consciousness. The powerful always have class consciousness. Right. It's the rest of them that they keep divided. Don't unionize. Don't come together. Don't this. Don't that. Race, sex, gender, religion, all of these things become tools of the oppressor to keep the oppressed oppressed. Right. Analyzing anything kind of like correlates to uh, a conclusion of, I guess you could say, truth to a point, right? Uh, any critical thinking will kind of break down exactly what, you know, I think like teaching methods or something that's kind of being presented to you, exactly what you were saying, like what's good for me is good for you. But all of us uh, as individuals have things that mean more to us than the individual individual next to us, right? So therefore, uh, we, we do not conjoint on that specifically. We never will. So 
Um, Swede, who, so. Swede, who is a expert in this field, like he is, I can vouch for his credentials, dual degreed in finance and economics, and is highly valued by private equity firms for what he does, right? Um, the market has decided on Swede's knowledge. So let's just put it that way, right? I copy you. Um, the average Amazon employee would have a million dollars in value if the company, uh, if the company was employee owned from the CEO down to the driver. So are we talking about laborers too, like forklift drivers, packagers? Yeah, everyone. So how many, okay. So I know there was a boom, like, you know, from COVID, um, specifically within like warehouse and logistics, a lot of shippers gained, uh, there was a lot of employment opportunities, which they did fill over like what a year and a half, two years. Uh, I know that they have broken that and have, uh, dumped tens of thousands of, uh, individuals after that. Um, I'm kind of, so now I kind of want to pull up the numbers that Amazon has as far as employers and see if that's actually something that would be logistical, like a million dollars. So if they even employed like 500,000 people, right? So you're talking about like $5 billion. I mean, <sighs> Amazon is a trillion dollar company. Yeah. And it's not with the outside of the aspect for, but for Bezos to um, kind of rest on that nest of the ass. So, ads. okay. Sweet is giving us numbers. Uh, they have yeah, a 1.5 trillion in market capitalization and a 1.5 million employee count. Holy shit. 1.5. That's beyond what I, okay. Yep. But I guess it does correlate because if, if we're talking about internationally, yes. But I mean, okay. again, this and is, you, but like, ultimately this is sort of what we're talking about is this functional disempowerment of the worker. Right. Um, by right. by an oligarchical class, because around these parts, I have long maintained we've there has never been any other. Fo OK, so with very, very, very small caveats and carve outs. Right. We're talking into the two percentage range. So when I say this always. Right. Let's just talk about the major players. Right. There has never been another form of governance other than oligarchs. Explain to me a nation or a conglomerate that you recognize as such in history or current that isn't controlled and manipulated by the rich and powerful. Yeah, you know what? That's a great comment. And I don't want to like step in anybody's toes, especially with their near ideologies. But when we talk about like uh, communism and socialism, this does correlate to that to a degree. Uh, which, which again, to make is why clear. I'm an anarchist. It, ah, thank you. Right. It behooves one if you're going to attempt to construct some sort of system, right? If you're going to construct some sort of methodology, which is all really what anarchism is. It's a lend, it's a set of tools. It's a tool belt with tools in it, right? And it is it provides you a lens of analysis and it provides you organizational techniques. Right. right. I look at it as a paradigm that's based off of other paradigms. Uh, it some yes some we've done a lot of work ourselves so i also like you know true got you like you know i want to put credit where credit's due there's some real thinkers that have been but long and short of it is that like okay so lord acton rule right lord acton british historian of fame power tends to corrupt absolute power corrupts absolutely right yes okay yes. so why don't you account for that in your system when you're designing it Oh, that's right. Because the because person <laughs> because the person who's usually implementing that is looking to be in power. There it is. Right? You're always like Lenin instituting a vanguard, right? Oh shit, we need the learned men of academia and science to lead the un unwashed stupid peasants into the glorious revolution. Right. <laughs> it, so whether you're talking about capitalism, which is intrinsically and in, inherently an oppressive hierarchical system, it's coercive by its very it's by nature, nature. It's coercive. Right. And yeah. but whether you're talking about communism. Right. It is a centralizing authoritarian system, just like capitalism is. <laughs> and so yeah. the, the flaw isn't in necessarily the economic designation or the distribution methodology. You could make either of these work theoretically. It's about resource allocation at the end of the day, really. Right? Yes. yes. But w what's the problem is that neither of them actually addresses the issue of authoritarianism. Both of them harness it rather than attempt to eliminate it. 
you still end up with Stalin and the leaders rolling around in the best cars that you can get, still living in palaces, right? And over here in capitalism, you still end up with, you know, the the leading class. The same thing, almost. The same fucking thing, right? You have yep. you end up with the same problem. So why don't we take this into account, flip it on its head, instead of go high, heter, uh, instead of going hierarchical, he, go heterarchical. So distribute as much of the power out sideways rather than vertically. Try to eliminate these coercions and these oppressions, challenge them where they are, dismantle those organizations, and build from the ground up rather than the top down, which is how all of these systems empower themselves. It is through a, mon a illegal monopolization of force at the highest level that the state empowers itself, right? It is whether you're in the Soviet Union or whether you're in the United States of America, what happens if you don't pay the fee that the state says you have to pay? Well, so in my opinion, I think, oh, sorry, continue. Well, I was just going to say, well, you're going to get yeah. fined extra. And when you don't pay that fine, they're going to come kicking in your door and trying to take your stuff. And if you resist them kicking in your door, trying to take your stuff, uh, congratulations, a militarized unit will be arriving soon. Right. And that's the end of the story for you. So right. like that is it is through a monopolization of force that w that the state empowers itself. And it is that under what that and many other sorts of things that anarchists seek to address. And it's like that's half your problem right there is you're you're standing there with a knife at my throat the entire time going, aren't you free? Say you're free. You're free. Right. You're free. Say you're free. Right. It's like I don't feel very free. There's some irony behind it, huh? Yeah, I don't feel very free right now. So I think that's kind of what I like matched with when we talked about like right leaning, especially with uh, my case earlier. Right. Uh, when I heard like uh, conservatives talk about like what it truly means to be free. Right. And of course, we understand like the uh, the general or even like stereotypical ideologies of like the right. Um, we see that they can go overboard and utilize like freedom as sort of like a badge or a talking point that is sort of symbolic for something else. Right. So I found some, uh, coworkers and I talked to them for a while and I, I came to this sort of conclusion how, um, liberals and, um, conservatives do have this very same fundamental core within how they ideologically look at life or existence. Right. It basically does fundamentally go down to what it is to be free. Uh, and what it takes to be free. And I do very much conjoint with that, right? Um, when you see these, like, right-wingers that buy out, like, um, big properties, like like farmland or whatever, then they, uh, I guess the, the best way to say it is, like, if you remember, like, COVID times, how people were stacking up toilet paper, that's how these guys would stack up ammunition and weapons and stuff like that, right? So they do kind of believe that if one thing comes to uh, another thing, then they have to, like, protect their land. But they want to, like, I don't want to say isolate themselves, but in, a, in the same degree, they are isolating themselves. They don't want to be a part of something that they mm -hmm. don't really truly believe in. And they, too, they do come to the conclusion that society, especially government, um, regulated society, has come to the point where it's not conducting um, as a freedom or freedom elements or freedom production the, sort of um, – The problem yeah. is ahead, that yeah. their lens of analysis, right, their method of looking at this – is <clears throat> fundamentally, I would compare it to feudalism. While they have successfully uh, ha while they have successfully figured out that somebody has a boot on their neck, right? They're like, I sure, feel yes. the boot, right? How do we get the boot off the neck? Well, not what... only how, because a big part of how is. What is attached to that boot? Yes. Right? What is that boot? Right? You, yeah. you have to be able to analyze wh who's wearing the boot. How is it being worn? Why is it on your neck? What is their justification? Right? There's follow-up questions to that that are super, super important as to how you go about the next step. Right? And then yeah. beyond that next step, if your underlying ideological principles and ethical frameworks are not sound and checked and analyzed for yourself, right, then what you see, and you see this in right-leaning circles so often, this is their 
one of their biggest foibles, and you see it with the Libertarians. You see it with these so-called ANCAPs. I swear to God, I'll just put this out there right now. If you ever hear anybody call themselves an anarcho-capitalist, just smack them for me and move on with your life. You cannot be a capitalist anarchist. That is not a thing. Um, so what, the, what they end up doing is is attempting to, rather than they attempt sovereign citizens, right? You have to be familiar with these morons. Oh, I am. And okay. you know what? Most of the cases that I've seen about sovereign citizens is fall flat. So, well, of course they do. But like rather than their their thought go – yeah, they have some great content. Uh, Secret Space Program they do. <laughs> wobble. Secret yeah. Space Program wobbles for the win. Those guys are hilarious. Um, great lore. Um, rather th- what they go to is – I am a sovereign. I am a king in my own right, right? Rather than go to the logical conclusion of there shouldn't be kings, there shouldn't be sovereigns, because the concept itself is flawed inherently, right? There's an intrinsic, oppressive, coercive quality to the thing that you are are striving to be in an attempt to gain equality and freedom for yourself. And that's what you see in those right-leaning circles is that in their pursuit of their freedom, they fail to recognize the freedoms of others. Often they pay it lip service, but they are 100% willing to trample the freedoms, the equalities, the equities, the so-called rights, the whole other concept, as uh, of the other humans if it means more for them. I, I really do agree with that. And I think one of the other things that they falter with is when they claim that they want to be sovereign, they still want the provisions that a society gives them as well. So they'll claim themselves to be sovereign and utilize that they're isolated, but still expect the things that a society will give them when they take their truck out to, I don't know, 20 miles down to downtown and go to a store. Those things are still run by uh, people of the community, things had to have happened in order for those commodities to be on those shelves, right? That didn't happen because you put that work and effort into that. Somebody else did. So you're not necessarily sovereign if you depend on other individuals um, utilizing their time and energy and their money to provide for you. Do you speak? So, do you speak English? Congratulations. Like, right? Can you do math? Congratulations. Right. 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 Like, it, it, there is people who think they're an island are nuts. Right? They're nuts. It's like it's. An, it's it's a creative ideology, right? And it's definitely like a false. Pre- it's it's I, it's utilizing fantasy within realism. I guess yes, it is. It is predicated upon a falsehood. It is. Sure. Um, and so, like, what we often find our criticism, like we have. Trust me, I'm I'm what's. If you want to get super nerdy about it, I'm what's qualified as a post left, post anarchist. Doesn't mean I've left the left. That's not what that means at all. Despite what Twitter may try to say. Right. Um, I, I do not define myself by the definitions of people who do not understand things. Um, but Good. functionally, it means that I have criticisms as an anarchist of the left. Post leftism is an anarchist position. And it's saying, hey, this is our team and I've got some stuff to say about it. Right. Like not leaving it firmly on this team, but I also have some recommendations for how we might improve some stuff, right? That's what post-leftism is. Um, And post-anarchism is uh, sort of a, a, it's a complicated ontological position. It's, It's a philosophical position that can be summed up as humanity is and wants to be anarchists. They just kind of are confused. And dissuaded and lied to and manipulated and abused and traumatized and, 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 and. But if you see in times of crisis, if you see more uh, is sort of like isolated communities, if you see the sort of like when you strip away a lot of the factors of humanity that complicate things, um, what you find is you start to see a lot of the things that anarchists get up to 
mutual aid, direct action, communal recognition at the same time as the uh, as the uplifting of the individual, utilizing the community to uplift the individual in order to loop back mechanism to uplift and empower the community. The recognition that there has to be a balance between these two things if one is to progress. The recognition that one's voice does uh, should be valued in a grassroots sense, that consensus decision making should be valued over, uh, over a simple majority. These sorts of concepts very quickly become sort of a norm in times of crisis, in smaller groups. And when you get down there and you look at it, it's sort of a position that this tool, these sets of tools have been with us for a very long time, probably before we started writing them down. Let's just put it that way. I was going to say before recorded history, because yes. everything that you just brought up are the fundamentals behind any village city town or whatever it's, that's literally how any it's how you organize a community yeah exactly um yeah as jesus said i was a stranger and you welcomed me i was hungry and you fed me i was naked and you clothed me it's not that complicated it really isn't now the execution therein in a modern sense is, can be terribly complicated but at the end of the day it's not that complicated of a set of ideals um and so we as anarchists sit back and look at like, you know, OK, so I mean, the right wing has stolen the word libertarian. It never was associated with them. And, it's you know, it's, it is a left wing concept. It is libertas. It is born of France. You know, it is that sort of thing uh, for eternité, liberté, that sort of thing. Right. Um, and but like, OK, that sort of thing. And so their their recognition of, oh, shit, I'm getting fucked. <laughs> right is valid but flawed and we would also argue that there's a ton of people on the left and the center that say oh shit i'm getting fucked and their analysis is flawed because this is there's no way for me to say this without ego and there's no way for me to say this without sounding self-serving right so i'm just going to asterisk the statement up front address the 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 potentially seemingly problematic nature of what I'm about to say and go from there. Anarchists have been on the right side of history almost every single time. The tools that we've assembled lend themselves to analyzing power cycles and power bases so effectively that when you look at suffragettes, you find anarchists. Right. When you look at women's lib movements, you find anarchists, right? Emma Goldman, especially amongst them, right? When you look at civil rights, you find anarchists amongst them. When Most you look at gay lib, you find anarchists amongst them. When you f look at native, uh, native or indigenous rights movements, you find anarchists amongst them. When you look at capitalism, you find anarchists amongst them. When you look at communism, you find uh, anti-capitalism, you find anarchists amongst them. When you look at anti-communism, you find anarchists amongst them, right? Anarchists have been on the right side of history mm -hmm. almost every single time. Now... Does that mean we're the winning team? No. <laughs> the world I was is cruel. Say, regardless of credit. <laughs> yes. Like we we're there. Like whether whether we win the battle or not, when you look at the track record, what were the anarchists saying in that moment of social conflict, right? And you're like, what team were they on? What side did they choose? What what was their criticism of the moment? Right? Over and over and over and over and over and over, you find that we're right. Because it's not some intrinsic thing. It's not we're somehow magically superior. It's that to be an anarchist requires a lot of learning, a lot of empathy, and a lot of understanding of power dynamics. And once you have that, it's like being a physicist in this world and someone trying to sell you a, a, a you know, perpetual motion machine. You're like, I understand the laws of physics well enough that you're not going to sell me a magic device that will make my car run forever, right? It, you, give, you, are, you earn, you learn the tools that allow you to look through this stuff and go, oh, you're full of shit. And... So we sit here and go, okay, yeah, you're right. You are getting fucked. It's the Jews. Okay, and now you're wrong. 
<laughs> right? The Kanye West aspect, I guess. Well, I mean, take take your pick. Like, I mean, a lot of people, a lot. Of, it's we around these parts. We say you're always three. They're always three questions away from the Jews. Jesus. Right. Yeah, he was a Jew too. Sorry, but yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, uh, Swede, uh, f- if I'm not that far, are you kidding me? Um, uh, Swede, uh, put a note pin in it. I'll get back to it. Um, <laughs> goddamn Jews. Um, oh, I bring up Starfield. Jesus. <laughs> um, uh, fucking. It, so, like, yeah, it, it's it's that sort of lack of critical analysis technique that, like, it's not difficult to feel the boot, right? You can feel it, but to actually know. To actually analyze it and to actually do that with a sense of intersectionality, which is super important. Being able to recognize that no one is a single thing. And right. that, and that's my uh, oh sorry. Uh, go ahead. You know, look, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say, like, so that's my like depiction about looking at reality. It's to uh it's to experience, analyze, dissect, and conclude based on any experience that you have it doesn't matter like um if it co- if, if it's parallel to anything that you believe or sort of like ruffles your feathers right it's just take that step back and do exactly the process that i that i mentioned right and that's basically the uh the form of intellectual critical analysis that i think that not just america but like most of the world has sort of like bypassed or circumnavigated at some point uh i remember like in the 90s like close to the 2000s having really big debates with people that cross like all sorts of like spectrums. Right. This is when we're talking about like the, uh, uh, at least for the United States when like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, uh, like third party sort of like inclusion started to come in. Then you had the green party and whatever. Right. Um, we started to kind of like derive out of the two party system and try to think for ourselves and then kind of correlate with other like, like mind or like-minded individuals to a point that we can like derive specifically from, uh, the two party system and kind of like, uh, kind of make us think about it, like at least raise some voices um, and get somebody on the ballot, right? Um, without that critical analysis, we don't have these powwows where people like sit and talk about things that are important. There has to be like, so 368 million people in the in just the United States alone, uh, no two people are going to have the same like correlative mindset, right? So we're going to have to sit down and think about ways to, as a society, like we're going to have to give up some things in order for people to eventually gain some things. Right. But so when you mentioned empathy earlier, I think that empathy plays a huge part about how people live. And I think that a lot of people forget about that empathy aspect as well, but empathy and critical thinking, when you combine them, create a great sort of um, basis for how you develop and maintain a society. I'll leave it there. So don't, don't uh, as well. Don't neglect the tolerance paradox. Because we, as, yes, an, we as anarchists have very specific feelings on some things. Um, we don't tolerate Nazis. And now I'm using that in a colloquial sense, but also a very literal sense, right? Yeah, because that, that's the type of mindset that will destroy a, um upcoming or um, maintained society. We, we, we have very specific actions that we are kind of notorious for. Um, when it comes to people who engage in authoritarianism, Mm -hmm. because there's no conversation to be had there. Once you cross that line into, you should do it because I said so, or because reasons that we know are made up, right? Like dogma, do it or I'll fucking spank you. (laughs) You know? Yes. Once you resort to that, then the conversation's over for us and We'll see you where we see you, right? Um, and so, like, there is an argument to be made, and on this channel, and I mean, I I have written many pieces on it. I've done quite a bit of speechifying on the matter. There is an argument to be made that there is no conversation to be had with the conservative right of this country. Oof. That if you want a specific moment, I could point to series of them. A series of them, right? Oh, no, I think I understand yeah. why you have that ideology. But then, so it's not even really playing devil's advocate. You seclude a, 
a major group of people yeah, where oh, you I, could take I, ideas yes. from, right? Not all of them have this I ha- consistent static mindset. Right? Well, but I have already resigned myself to the balkanization of the U.S. is a process that started before me and is just is continuing, right? It's just more of a safety net. That or- like we're 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 four countries masquerading as one. Masquerading is a good, yeah. Go right? Ahead. Like, let's, honestly, honestly. No, it's very honest. Yeah. Like, where, where, there, we know. Like, when is Vermont going to agree with Arkansas? <laughs> yeah. It's, um, that's sort of the thing about, like, solitude within, like, the United States. That, that, that word united doesn't mean as much as it did 200 years ago. Yeah, I, I, so like, and also, I mean, the rise of modern technology and production institute and like production institutions and that sort of thing, like you, uh, you very quickly, like, yeah, you actually could run this, this, this way. Right. Um, but like ideologically speaking, right. Let's start with this. Let's just, just start with the Southern Baptist, right. Because they're very important to this conversation. I agree. Go ahead. Why do the Southern Baptists exist? Do you know that story? Um, why is there why you know, is there I'm a like northern the that's more learned why is there so a northern I'm, I'm baptist convention and a southern baptist convention so i'm going to add one thing the first 16 years of my life i grew up in a northern baptist church Interesting. and within that um 16 years i didn't learn anything about like the depiction of northern baptist versus southern baptist right i learned a very little bit amount of that after uh say i got out of high school and it's not enough to be educated and make a um, conversation about it. So I will defer cool. to you to explain um, to me. Hi, I've been an ordained minister for almost 20 years too. Um, oh, nice. So <laughs> um, okay. the Southern Baptist Convention exists for a singular reason. There's very few instances when schisms form where you can point to a singular causal event, right? Usually mm. it's a Martin Luther style list. Right. I was just saying, like, maybe Mormonistic. Yeah. Right. You got a fucking, they got a list of grievances usually. Right. <laughs> Southern Baptists <Who> doesn't? <laughs> split from the Baptist convention because they wanted to use the Bible to justify owning black people. Jesus. That okay, is, so that's not something I heard. That is their Continue. raison d'etre. That is why the Northern Baptist convention took their toys and went home. They so sit- is this ideology still upheld like currently? <sighs> or is there a schism from the schism? One can argue that it has been downplayed for the purposes of P- PR relations. And I understand exactly what you mean, which is when uh, people talk about when there's a recruiting reference with like Aryan Nations or White Power Cats, um, it's all done in code. Yes. So what they 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 split off. And they very distinctly, they there is all sorts of rhetoric. I don't have my pad next to me. I just read you verbatim from uh, from the you're pieces. You're fine. I write. You're fine. There is all sorts of rhetoric from their convention leader, from you doing a fucking um, at one of their one of their speeches. He said, um, "Pastors who preach integration are um, are false prophets." Right. Uh, yes, they're they're very specific on this matter. The Southern Baptists exist because they felt there was a biblical justification for the ownership of black people. Which is funny because the history of their own religion is, is Arabic. Uh. Um, so that's why they exist. Now, we fast forward a little bit and they find out they start setting up private religious universities. Right. Uh, now, this I've heard about. Right. Yes. And they find that this is an exemption for se- uh, for segregation. The South is like, oh, shit, public schools have to be integrated and we're going to fight hard against that, aren't we? Um, <laughs> but our private institutions are exempt. So the churches start setting up private ch- uh, private schools. What do these do? Well, they do a couple of things. One, it lets them be racist. Fun. Two, it lets them brainwash a new generation. Oh, that's useful. And three, which is very American, it's highly profitable. Lots of money come in those private church institutions. That's a lot, a lot of cash. Well, Jimmy Carter comes along and says, IRS, if they don't 
integrate, we're sending the IRS after you. We took down Al Capone. We'll take down your racist church. Fair. So they see this as an existential threat to not only legions of brainwashed youths, ideological underpinnings, but again, continuing in true American fashion, their pocketbooks. So they embraced this existential threat and there was a meeting in Texas prior to a stump speech um, by a, I don't know, he's a little known candidate at the time. You may have heard of him, a gentleman by the name of Ronald Reagan. Never heard of him. Yes. The Southern Baptist leaders in combination with a few political movers and shakers and the conservative right Uh, The conservative, I'm sorry, the financial conservative right, right? This is the 80s we're talking about, the Wall Street crew. Come together in Texas, in Dallas, prior to a speech by Ronald Reagan and cut a deal with Reagan. We will preach from the pulpit that you are the next to be the next president if you promise us one thing. You call off the IRS. In that speech, testament to what was important to the religious right in this country at the time, there was no mention of abortion, which they didn't care about for generations. There was no mention of intermarriage. There was no mention of gays. There was no mention of anything that you would modern, in the modern context, attribute to this group of people. What there was mention of, though, was the attack by the IRS on the private religious learning facilities of the Southern Baptists. And they went back to their congregations in mass and said, this is the game plan. They preached from the pulpits that Ronald Reagan is here to save Christianity in this nation, that the Democrats are the worshipers of Satan, <laughs> That they are here to do the bidding of the dark Lord. And if you do not get to that voting booth and vote for Ronald Reagan, they will come for you. They will come for your children. Hold on. This sounds oddly familiar. And Ronald Reagan won by a margin because of a new alliance formed. And within the first year, the IRS was instructed by the executive branch of the United States to decommission their investigation into the private religious universities and schools of the Deep South. And in that moment, a deal was struck, a deal with the devil, in which the conservative financial right and the religious right of this country were bound. And they have yet to find their way apart. And you fast forward through a whole bunch of stuff Mega churches, dominionism, the religious rights takeover of the military in this country, up to and including dominionists who believe that there should be actual biblical Old Testament law that governs this land, up to including burning witches. This is very real, very documented, and I've done it very extensively, having meetings in the Pentagon every week with generals, right? It is so entrenched, so intrinsic at this point. That I do not see how me as a gay man, me as a member of the actual left, not the demonic left that the the right seemed, like Democrats, who are nothing more than right-leaning, sometimes centrists, right? They aren't. They aren't the left. There is no left in this country politically represented. Are you kidding me? Like... We haven't had a leftist party as like perspective in this country in a very, very long time, right? Like 14, 18 years. Oh, yeah, lo- I highly agree with that comment. Much, much longer than that. We're talking many, benefit of a, yeah. We're yeah. we're talking the thirties. Oh, oh, I, okay. So I could get your perspective on that. Go yes, ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're talking the thirties sort of territory on this matter. Yeah, you're you're very yeah you're very correct. Uh, I was just. Yes. Thinking or thinking more modernly, but yeah, go ahead. yeah, like it's been a while. We got Bernie, right? Oh, what did he do for you? I mean, <laughs> he did. Admittedly, he mainstreamed a lot of ideas, 
So I'll take it. I'll take it. I will 100% take it. No criticism. I'd love to have 1960s Bernie back. So I'd love to have him fucking on the on the con- congressional floor screaming about how we need to dissolve the CIA and fucking take care man. of our people. Like, I'd love to have that version of Bernie back, but I get what he did, why he did it, and it is what it is at this point. But, yeah, right, I don't see how I, as a leftist, as an anarchist, as a gay man, as somebody who, uh, you know, would prefer trans kids to not commit suicide because they're ostracized as somebody who would prefer not to have gay kids beaten and tied to fences and left to die. Me as somebody who says, Hey, maybe we don't bomb OBGYN doctors clinics because they occasionally offer an abortion to a woman who should have rights over her own body to start with. Right. Right. I don't see how, in good faith, anyone can tell me that there's a conversation to be had there. Now, am I willing to have that conversation? Yes. But it's like, I think, I think this is a fair comparison. It's like telling a slave Mm -hmm. that they should, they should, well, I understand what they did to you but you should still be willing to compromise and talk to them. That's the weird thing. I understand what they did to you. They, like, right? Like, do I need to say anything else? Like, seriously. Like, they, I am old enough, I'm 40. I'm old enough I lived through the, like, a good chunk of the age crisis. Like, I was alive and aware and saw it, and I'm gay. I remember them cheering God's solution to homosexuality. Yeah. Right? Like, I remember them encouraging genocide. I remember the statist cooperation between the Reagan administration and them on this matter. I remember these things. I was there. Right? You mind me asking real quick, like, so in the 90s, where did you grow up? Uh, I moved all over this country. Um, By 19, I had visited all 48 contiguous states. Um, okay. my mom was a corporate reorganizer. She was a nurse by trade and she got her MBA and she ended up a corporate reorganizer for hospitals. So I lived all over this country. I was born in new England. I'm a Vermonter by birth and it is, will, and always will be a part of my soul. That's where I sort of spawned as an anarchist, right? You class spawn as an anarchist in Vermont. Um, that's your Bernie love too, huh? Well, the reason why I ask is, um, but I've lived in so, Tennessee. Exactly. I've lived in the Southwest. I've lived on the West Coast. I've I've lived all over this country and been around all of its people. Well, the reason why I ask specifically is, um, I remember why, not why. So in the '90s, so I'm about as old as you. I'm 42. Uh, come this December, right? So the whole like anti, it wasn't LGBT at least for where I grew up, it was very much just anti-gay. And that's how I yes. got into being called anti in the South side of Chicago. And anti just means anti-Nazi. And there was a lot of like white power affiliation, you know, uh, in the South side of Chicago within white communities. Right. But it never had anything to do with like blacks and Jews. Right. It had to do everything with like whites that were anti-Nazi and like people that were gay or people that might have like men dressed as women. Right. That was like their major concern. Right. Drag. So when I talk about when I got kicked out of two high schools by beating the shit out of skinheads, um, one of those things uh, correlated to exactly that, uh, which is why I find it really fucking hard to get on top of like <sighs> when people say, hey, you're like right leaning. And I I take sort of like uh, um, what's the word for it? like uh, offense to that. Right. Because, well. A lot of what the right still talks about is very much, I don't want to say anti-LGBT, right? They're not very much anti that, but they're anti-specific portions of that community allowing themselves to be themselves, right? I feel like stonewalling them disallows them to be genuine within themselves and allows them to partake within the community on a normalized way, right? And when I went through that with the 90s, like, the first time I got kicked out of high school was, and I find it funny that when we talked about the South, uh, the Southern Baptist aspect of like privatized schools, I went to a school called Marist and that was an all boys Catholic high school. And that's where the, like the stem of the problem arose from when you have that sort of like all white, all boys, um, everybody that goes there has money. So therefore like there's sort of a cultural aspect in there, right? It's, um, 
very much white leaning. We'll just leave it at that. Right. And I took too well, I saw too much happening. And at the end of the class, I confronted uh, an individual I'm like, you don't get to do that to that person. You can go fuck yourself. Right. And they're like, oh, do you want to take it out to the uh, uh, out to the hall? And I'm like, by all means, you go ahead. And he pussied out. I go into my locker. He uh, he ended up getting somebody else to fight that fight for him. And what disrespect to me, but also disrespect yourself. But anyways, that's how I like ended up getting kicked out. But I remember when my grandfather and my father, who were both alumni from that school, showed up to that meeting and they were like, yep, yeah, my, my son has been talking to both of us and to you about this problem that's been happening in your school. And they, within the table of 12 individuals there, right? Me, my father, my grandfather, and the rest of the nine uh, cadre for that school, right? Just specifically denied that that was a problem, right? And I remember talking to my grandfather and my father after that. Like, see, this is the same shit that happens all the time, right? Um, when my grandfather, who was funding me going to that school, said, I agree with what happened, and I'm not going to dog you, even though I paid an exorbitant amount of money to go there. I think it was something like five, dollars $6,000 a year, which back in the 90s was pretty extreme, right? He agreed with my reasoning for uh, leaving that school. Let's put it that way, right? Um, but this... <sighs> culture of like anti-gay shit was always like the premise behind my hatred behind individuals we, somebody said earlier like um we do not tolerate intoleration or whatever the fuck that quote was yeah i highly agree with it which is this like to my core what i believe right um it, i just kind of wanted to because we talked about it a little bit when you made reactions and and people want to talk about like well, why were you considered right right leaning or whatever like I just wanted to make sure like I still I like, still want to know fucking, what what opinions core, you dude. express that people mm -hmm. qualify as right leaning what 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 give me an example of something that you would say that somebody would say oh you're right leaning for that okay so even though I grew up okay so I want to bring it back so I feel like context is very important within. Uh, conversations that have um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the potential to uh, be interpreted uh, as problematic, tension, right? <laughs> yeah, or create tension, right? Um, so there are some morals and virtues that I still believe in that were inherently passed on to me, right? So, like I said, uh, I grew up. Uh, my dad had the keys to this church, so let's just understand that. Like I was at church like three days a week until I was like 16, right? So the morals and virtues that I kind of like take or took in, right? Uh, when I was 16, then I started like a studying uh, like occult shit, right? And questioning things. And I remember my dad is like, he grounded me indefinitely, which was like four weeks. But when I ended up having conversations with him, when he actually fucking died down within uh, his own deluded sort of like mindset with all that, um, he understood like what the complications were with my mindset, right? Being taught by one faction and not like being allowed to listen to other factions, right? But then when I listen to other factions, I have questions, right? I think that's sort of imperative and connective with what I'm talking about, right? This is like white, uh, or these Aryan nationalists, they'll listen to what say their parents or like their uh, friends will say, but they don't really want to kind of conclude like if they if they want to talk about like well I hate gays for this reason well what is your reasoning is this a reasoning that you made up or is this a reasoning that you heard from other people and because you want to be like socially connected to these people you kind of utilize that reasoning without you know really questioning it right that's why I talk about critical thinking but I started to see that within religion and I kind of dipped out of that for a long time right um, but it, it only became very evident that when I saw that people were blindly following shit that was just literally taught to them that I started to question literally everything around me. Um, and I think that's what became of, I guess you could say my behavior to be very open-minded. And even if I do have like a, uh, a moral or a vir virtue or ideology that I hold like very much like as a pillar of like my behavior, Such who I as? Am, I'm very subjected to change that given like some proof or evidence or even some empathy as to why I should change that. Right. So I'm very, I guess you could say dynamic, which is why I say I'm, I'm very center. I don't hold any like political spectrum, but when we talk about the right leaning aspect, yes, I'm going full circle with that. Um, it seems that the values that I learned, you know, growing up in that church household seem to be a part of me to a, uh, to a degree. Right. And I kind of see that the left is like going into this very like, and I don't want to say that like atheism has a conclusion to my um, uh, my outlook on like the overall like community within the left, or you can see even like the far left or extreme left within this. But to a point, I see that 
the far left, I mean, the far, far left is they're creating some sort of uh, culture or community that is absence of morals and virtues. And this is the stuff that I used to like endure when I was like 13 or 14. I used to love it. Right. Like fuck every construct, fuck what everybody else wants to say, just do what you want to do. And I highly respect that. Right. But it comes to a point when you realize how society works and these things can't really be reduced into the way that, because I think this thing has to happen, then everybody should be subjected to this. Right. And I'm just being general for a very good reason. I'm not trying to like, you know, like step on anybody's toes on this. I, but I, 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 I want to press you. Yeah, if like, you want to cut in, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I, okay. So one, as somebody said, like we understand you're here in good faith. Like you can drop the the, the sort of asterisking, but copy. Um. So what I'm hearing is that you still utilize a religiously informed, a a probably Abrahamically Christo-informed set of value principles as some sort of center pole for your operating method. And the you see the hedonistic eschewing of such things as a potentially problem uh, problematic endeavor by certain elements of the far far left. In your own words, is that a fair encapsulation? It is, and it isn't right because, of course, everything is much more nuanced than the a specific of course. like one time thing, right? Um, so it's not so much what I live through that becomes my core it's when i like i say my experience i take that i dissect it i analyze and then i conclude right so everybody's different and nobody should be a mirror image of anybody else right this means that you are your own self right so let's let's add one piece of context before i continue um i despise religion and i believe specifically within the spirituality um path that everybody should take and every one of those paths that everybody takes should be individualized behind their experience right so it's it's based on life experience your decision should be based on what your experience is what your dissection of uh information experiences should be and your conclusion from that critical thinking process right but there are too many times where i see a group of people multitude of groups of people on both sides completely parrot like what they call the hive mind right echo chamber the same things that they heard like say candace oh when's your fucking chain you were fucking say and i'm just like you I, I literally just heard that same exact comment from from this pundit yesterday or whatever whenever they uh, put the video out so you're not thinking for yourself you're just parroting these things and i understand that you want to cling to that but man it's a very would, dangerous thing to do, right? I would, and I expect that as an anarchist, you would kind of like, well, you would understand that. I right? would counsel then um, to <sighs> yes, uh, sweethearts, but um, <sighs> I'm trying hard not to look at chat. Uh, uh, I just want to be. It's okay. I, you you, you do. Yeah. yeah, you do. I have to. <laughs> Um, I understand it's but, you get paid to do it. <laughs> it's new. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. No, this is a form of activism for me. Um, so, yeah. Um, <sighs> yeah, take a minute to think about it. Ultimately, it's, it's not a matter of the political spectrum. It right. should never be. Well, it, it's a it's a it, falsity, no, right? Uh, well, it's it's well, politicians are con artists. Well, they're, no, they're that's actors that's their a lives human behavior. Wanting, yes, wanting yes. to belong to the in group, no matter how you identify it. That's a social need. is a part of just psych, human psychology and sociology one on one territory, right? Yeah, that's that's a mass little hierarchy of needs sort of thing, right? Which I do actually do. I do agree. So, that. like, yeah. ultimately, like. Yeah, there's always going to be that. I now I will never speak for the 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 comms on my side. We do not get along. Communists and anarchists are more communists have killed more of my brethren than capitalists have. Okay? Through direct But there should still be a through a direct action. Band, right. So I can't speak to that group specifically because okay, I, re I, I refuse to speak to that group specifically. Um, they can kick rocks as far as I'm concerned. Um, and they're I not, they're not fans of us either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't imagine. Right. Um, so, but 
I would say at least as a generalization, um, thank you, Moon. As a generalization, if we, we have to, because we have to, right? Like ultimately we have to. Um, yeah, because we're judges by nature, sure. The right actively in, in direct hypocritical contradiction to their rhetoric actually encourages that degree of groupthink. Whereas at least rhetorically and seemingly in some action, that hedonistic aspect of the left drives an individualism <laughs> that could yeah. lend itself to the processes that you're, you're, you know, es espousing. Yes. Right. I like it may, it, it won't, the thing, there is honest. no guarantee. There's no intrinsic. There's no perfect. There's no that sort of thing. But at yeah. least the so, application of an individualized empirical process, which, I mean, you're talking about being a scientist. At the end of the day, you're sure. talking about yeah. being a scientist in your everyday life, right? Or, or at the very, most or least or whatever, being a, a, a philosopher. You like, really. you know, you, you, what did you expect? Empiricism 101, right? Like this is, what yep. did you experience? Now, can you analyze it critically? Can you, you know, then engage your emotional processes after that, that sort of thing, right? right? Like dissect and conclude, right? Like, so at the end of the day, like that, that sort of is wasn't always and doesn't have to be. But in the modern context especially, and I'm going to say modern in the sense of like the last 200 years sort of modern, right? We're, Ooh, talking, we're okay. talking human history modern, right? I can, I can get down to – yeah, go ahead. Okay. So in the last – in the modern context, the religiously inspired, shall we say, have been <laughs> – um, divorcing themselves and walling themselves in more and more from those types of critical processes. And while you see instances of it, certainly within other sectors of political ideology, of other philosophical underpinnings, you absolutely see solipsistic takes, you absolutely X, Y, and Z, right? It exists elsewhere. Right. It's a human trait. It, exactly. There right. does seem to be a cohort that is engaging in it in a rapidly progressing manner mm -hmm. that seems overly problematic. And while I have issues, again, post-leftist, right? I have complaints yeah. about my own team. <laughs> um, Tell me about it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> right? I have complaints. Um, but I also have solutions for those complaints. Um, but One of the few then. I ultimately compare it to this. The Democrats and the Republicans. They are Your both side. <laughs> they are both hugely problematic. For the same reasons. Well, well let's see what yours are. They are both hugely problematic. I am trapped in a room with both of them. Mm. And one of them, both of them are actively stealing from me. And actively use the threat of a third-party entity to harm me. But yep. one of those is happy to sit by while I'm killed, while the other has a knife to my back. Now, are you too sure about that? Yes, I, 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 I am certain in that matter. Like, as a gay man in America, I'm not, yeah, yeah, I'm not you know confused. What? And, it, you know, that's the kind of – yeah, I have to add that into yeah. my response on that, and I do understand why you respond that way, so I'm going to digress. Yeah, like it, it – one of them has a knife to my back. The other one is hugely problematic to my life and will stand there while this other dude stabs the shit out of me. Absolutely. Yeah. I can't count on them for any help whatsoever. And again, they're utilizing the same, same third-party bodyguard to casually threaten me from time to time, right? I, I have no, yeah. no illusions about our relationship here, right? But <laughs> – Good way of putting it. Right? But triage. My mom's a nurse, right? triage order of operations right you hit the ground running you're in the battlefield and you're getting shot at you need to dive for cover you need to know where the amp where the bullets are coming from and where to place yourself right yep. so you don't yep. catch a, a round in the fucking dome 
<laughs> and and so ultimately, my biggest issue lies with conservative, right wing, Republican, yeah. religious aligned individuals and groups at this time. So when we hear like both sides arguments or centrist arguments, like especially around these parts, we have the degree of intersectional analysis, the anarchistic tools that so many of us have through our actions. There's two ways to become an anarchist via the street or via uh, theory. I have a, I have a deep love for the ones who learn it on the street and then become theory heads. Um, that are like, oh, I've, this has been working for me, but I need to learn more about it. What is what is going on here? And then they just go theory head. That's how I came to it. That's how I think most people should, right? Those right. of us in these circles that have these tools, instinctually almost, look at this situation and are not ever fooled by this false dichotomy. They aren't the same. They aren't equal. Right for many Americans now. If you happen to be a white, a white own, uh, a white male land owning heterosexual cisgendered person, right? Hey, that's me. <laughs> right, like if you happen to be in that position, right. then that analysis for yourself would come out with a very different outcome. And I see that, which is why I said, "Hey, that's me." Just so you understand, right? right? Yeah, but. Yes. If you have that tool of intersectionality and if you have enough empathy to utilize it honestly. Honestly, that's key word. Go. Right. Yeah. With, with authenticity and integrity. Right. Which you don't get much. Yes. It, exactly. Right. If you have those. Right. Then you look at the playing field and go, oh, it's not about me. Really, is it? Right. It's, like, there it's, it is. yeah, like it's, it's not like I can't speak to the life of a black trans sex worker in the inner city. Can I? Right. Like, yeah, no shit. Like right. that's a whole other ballgame. Even ball if you game. have friends and you go, well, hey, I have black friends or I have trans friends. You still don't have, like, that's the one thing that I'm like, really like, how do you put it? So sometimes I will say, look, I do have, like, I've grown up with gay friends. So therefore I can say that I have it enlightened me you, with yes. some experience because I do have those friends and I communicate with them for fuck 25 years. Right. But when somebody pulls out like, oh, I have black friends. Oh man. It's just like, it is fucking cringe. It, it, um, I mean, because we understand where that's going to go. It, it well, so but yeah, I mean, usually, it? yeah, when you hear that sort of phrase, right? It, it's 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 highly claw, uh, clawed. I mean, there's jokes exactly. around this community. Like we, a bunch of us took like the Harvard uh, racial implicity test and stuff like that, right? Um, to oh, see God. if we have any implicit biases and stuff like that. I'm sure everybody but, has some. <laughs> oh well, see, that's interesting. A couple a couple of people actually came out with none. They came out neutral. Um, but was that honest? So that's the thing, right? Those, oh, those it's that tests, that no that that test is um like sub reaction time. Oh, so it's timed. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You instantly have to answer. It's not. You oh, don't I get saw to a think video about on this. Yes. Yes. You're, yeah. It's based on your instant reaction. Yes. Response. So you very quickly. Very like, yeah. It is that sort of thing. It's an implicit bias. Two of us yes. infamously came out with bi heavy biases. Uh, dig. And myself came out with very heavy biases against white well, people. That's related to your, on your life. Against uh, white, white people. She and I are okay, both but white. that's not to be unexpected either, right? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. But it's not necessarily white people. It's about what, like, the expectancy of white people do. It, 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 it is. And so, yeah. like, you know, like, did the, the old joke, like, you know, I see a white dude in a three-piece suit walking down the street. I'm going to cross. Right. Like yeah. <laughs> that's who I'm, I get you. that's who I'm afraid of. Right. Like I, I, I grew up a good portion in Tennessee. I dated a bunch of black dudes. One of like one of the deep people that matters in portion of my life who I care about deeply to this day. We just don't, it didn't work. Right. Um, it, like yeah. I was there when his mother kicked him out and he cried on my shoulder because of some stupid black gnat propaganda that she bought into and the global white oh, homo no. agenda converted him and he's working for Satan and that sort of stuff. And, you know, I what? was, in, I was invited to the cookouts in the deep South. Right. I've, I, I have a, if you're invited as a white man to the cookouts, fuck. Right. Yeah, like I've been there. <laughs> and so it's yeah. like, yeah, I have more than just black friends. Like I, I was integrated to a huge degree into the culture um right. it was a part my of my point. experience so if you have friends like that you've dealt or if you've been a part of their life for like 5 10 20 years 
you know, so I see it like the people that don't have the that type of like connectivity to those types of friends will start up with a conversation like, well, I got black friends or I got gay friends, right? But usually when people actually have conversations in like uh maybe daily or weekly like interactions with these people, they will start with like, so here's the experience that I've noticed from friends that I have. They don't necessarily have to inject yeah. with with exactly the type of uh, like check marks, right? Usually they're, they're it with starts with experience. a defense of the position anyway. Right. It, it okay, doesn't right. it doesn't lead with, well, all these people asking for reparation. You're like, OK. And then if you know, you'd, as soon as you get hit with that, you're like, like you see it coming at know. that point. Right. Yeah, yeah. You're like, if you truly understood this group, if you truly be a had, lot more nuanced. Yeah, exactly. You going into that, you probably would not have been saying stupid shit to start with. So, yeah, so the odds of you having favorable black friends or people of color or whatever the case may be, probably very slim to what you're per, like precluding. Yes. Uh, within your, yeah, uh, unless, and unless, uh, unless, again, um, well, they're not I was taught the, the N-word by a black man. I can say it. Yeah, go ahead. I, I've been there. Little white boy from Vermont. Right. I had no context for black people. I, I, I've told this story before. I thought they were just really sunburned white people. I had no idea. I had no idea. I was just like, they're just people. Right. Like, they're just people. Like, I just thought people were people. And that, like, I'm like, oh, yeah, good I, mindset to have. I, I tan up. Like, I guess if you just keep tanning up, you just, you know, yeah. And which, evolutionarily speaking, is actually kind of what's going on there. Oh, no, yeah. Melatonin and everything. That's actually um, pretty appropriate. Yeah. Um, so, like, but I had a, PhD chemist for the oh, Eastman wow. Chemical Company. Um, tell me, sit me down, little white boy me, blonde hair, <laughs> fucking, you know, fuck, little white boy me, fucking. Oh, you're blonde. <laughs> I, fucking, I, oh, I have, I used to have blue eyes. I used to have blonde hair. It's all, it's fucking. Now it's hazel and brown. It's weird, dude. I have questions later, but go ahead. Um. <laughs> So, like, he sat me down, and I wish to this day, desperately wish I knew what he turned on MTV, and he said, you see that right there? That's an N-word. Me? I'm a black man. I had no you idea what, what you saw. I have, no, I desperately wish I could remember. It, it, I, I didn't, I would, I just wanted to play with my friend. Yo, so that, oh, man. Like you're, I had, you're connect, I'm connecting what you want. On like I had no right. idea what was going on and what he was doing to me, yeah. right? Like I had no idea. And now in context, you. Right. and now in context, I can see that intersectional analysis. He had no, uh, he had no class resolve in him. He had divorced himself from this in, this racial issue entirely. He so elevated himself due to his academic and education and and his economic performance in the world. He saw he himself. Might not have been married in the first place. Yeah, he saw himself as a better person than the person on TV, because he was a PhD chemist for a multinational corporation who had made a very good living, and that person on TV was rapping about ne'er-do-well stuff, I'm sure, right? And he yeah, drew sure. this distinction for himself and passed it on to one of his kid's friends, right? Or attempted to, at least. It just didn't stick, but it's a st formative story for me that it's like this. And so this well-to-do upper middle class black man had less in common with a white boy from Vermont uh, w had less in common with the, um, the black person on the screen, right? Like then say potentially a poor white person in Appalachia has with that person on the screen. Do you remember what like age window, uh, the two of you were during that time? I would have been 12. Yeah. So that's very important, especially within like gaining social relevance. Right. Um, and I think that's the thing that he tried to do to you um, is try to point out like this is an exemplary of like my culture, at least the way I explain it, and, you know, talking for him just assumptively. Right. And I think that's what he was kind of doing to you. And that's why I spoke what how I said earlier, like, wow, man, it really feels like I could identify exactly what you're talking about, because um, I had a position where I was. The best way to put it is like I was at a public park and I was literally picked up and thrown into. So back then, 
context is wild. Um, there, it was about March, and in the south side of Chicago, there is a uh, Irish parade, right? So back then, they would have police on horses. So they would <laughs> stable the horses at Kennedy Park, which is where we're hanging out. Well, when you stable horses somewhere, they shit everywhere. So this guy literally threw me in a pile of shit. And I was like, what, 11, right? And uh, it was a black kid that fucking did it, right? And it definitely had this sort of kind of sense in my head, right? So I just, I, I, got, I picked myself up and I got on my bike and I drove, like, rode myself home. And this black kid who I've never fucking met before just followed me the whole way, right? I remember parking my bike right next to my uh, garage. I'm like, are you one of them? He's like, no, I just want to make sure you're good. Long story short, man, um, the next five years was just me hanging out in the fucking ghetto with him and all of his friends. It's not that, like, we weren't even, like, my, my white family was not nowhere, it was nowhere middle class, bro. Like, the house that we had was because my grandfather was somewhat of a millionaire. Not that he was, like, exuberant with this money, but he's like, yeah, so my children need, because they have children need somewhere to, like, house their children. So my dad was paying the mortgage via him paying, you know, my grandfather paying for the house, right? We didn't have really any money. It was really funny because when I hung out with that dude, Jerry, over there in the, in the fucking hood, I learned more hanging out with him and his friends with, like, learning about black culture. I guess that's the way you could say it. Um, I found um, identification within black culture more than I found with any white culture I've ever had because it just made sense. It was very logical. And these cats weren't, like, they weren't hood. They weren't, like, uh, thugs or anything like that. We never, like, went out to commit any crimes. There was this sort of, like, urban-esque, uh, like, um, pers pers personality about them, right? But at the same time, they were very smart because the individuals that kept them, like their, their parents, were, were products of the 60s, were like 50s and 60s, we're talking about like MLK and shit like that, right? So it wasn't just like, oh, there's a fucking white kid in my apartment. Holy shit, what do I do? No, it was very much like encompassing. It was, it was like, I I'm so glad that you're here. Let's let's mix up cultures. Let's talk about shit, right? And that, this, that five years was yeah. very much about like that learning process, right? I think my point about bringing that up is you don't really get that nowadays. So that's why you do I think, have this. I think, very happy I think we do get it. I think we get it more. Okay, copy I, you. Thank you. I, I think we get it more now than ever. Um, But I think that's very important to bring up because I think that within like 2022 and 2023, there's this huge racial divide. It is expected to see within cultures. But, but I think there's a mixing of cultures. How many white kids see rap and hip-hop as black people music that's funny you say that because i never really did but then again uh -huh. it, how many how huh. many zoomers and gen alpha do you think see hip-hop as black people music so that's a um not i almost want to none. say it didn't no, that's i don't i don't think that's true because i, you I have rappers like current rappers like uh tom mcdonald and whatnot you do have like prominent, really good rappers that are I, white. I, well, so but I'm not I, I sure think, about how to answer that. I I think that there's well, see that's but that's my point is I didn't say like like how many ki how many zoomers and alphas do you think it's it's negligible at this point, including black kids. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, right. I you're going the, the number <laughs> the number one selling uh, rap artist of all time is white. 50 Cent himself. He's like, yeah. look, you may hate Eminem. M for oh, yeah. you may hate M for being white, but he's the best at the game, and you just can't deny that. Like the, the number one is a white dude. You can hate it, right. but it's the reality of the situation. And you, we're several generations down from that point now. Sorry, M's an old uh, M's an old man years. now. Right? Yeah. Like this is this is way post like, you know, Pac and Biggie. Like this is several generations on. And so you start to see this this sort of like intermingling due to and a lifelong IT guy here, technology. Ditto. You Ditto. there is an elimination of accents in England. This is a great this is a Ooh. great uh sub study, right? Accents are starting to merge in England and you start to see this hyper regional accents that used to be very predominant drawing down and changing into a more common accent point because of technology. But be technology is the precursor from the merging of cultures. Um, Elena, just now, Gen Alpha is losing their accent in Georgia, USA. I read this week. Yeah. Yeah. Like it is 
there is this sharing of culture at a globalistic scale now. Like I've got, I've got a mod and one of the longest members of the community pre Twitch friend cat, um, who he, um, he's constantly into like some weird, like he'll just like, and this week it's like Russian doomer emo music from like the, like the broken <laughs> suburb, like, you know, the angry white boy suburb music, like the depressed white boy suburb music, but of like a Russian suburb. And he's like, Hey, have you heard this sort of thing? And it's like, where but the, it hit. <laughs> like, where do you find this Go shit? Right. Like Zoomer, Zoomer, Mexican emo, dep like depressed suburban music. Like he showed me a video of like the kids filming it in the suburbs and shit and like that. Like it's, you know, all of this sort of stuff. Like there is this degree of exposure to other cultures and other societies right. that is has to have some degree of knock on effect. Now, I used to say that it would be like emulation, but that when you bring up exposure brings up like another like. I guess modern position that it is currently at. It's, I, it's not necessarily emulation. I mean, we, emulation anymore. Yeah, we're functional. Like Kaiser, Universal Race Gang, Kai, uh, per, person in chat, Kaiser. You can't get a pin on him. You can't <laughs> get a pin on it. He's it. just you put him with next to anybody, and you're like, yeah, I kind of see it. Uh, it's fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Um, yeah. we're functionally waiting for the boomers to die. Oh, we are. We are. We're functionally waiting for the boomers to die. Now, can I ask what that is as far as like they're they're I old and they're old and they refuse to change their minds about anything. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. Say, I'm not talking millennials still have that position. too. Uh, uh, millennials are the most progressive generation that this uh, this continent has ever seen. And that's compared to Zoomers even. All the polling tells us the millennials are the most progressive generation ever on this uh, on this continent. I really feel like I want to handshake you with that, but I've also heard the depiction of like what year frame uh, millennials are considered. So two of us are very much about like the same age, around four. I am right? I am an elder millennial, and you might be cusp of Gen X. I'm I'm December eighty one, so very cusp, I guess. Yes, I, I am as old as a millennial can get. Um, okay. Like, yeah, I'm first wave millennial, basically. Um, yeah. And like, yeah, first wave. <laughs> yeah. And like Gen X. Yeah. And Gen X is a 50, 50 sweat. And again, Gen X yeah, doesn't matter. They don't fucking matter. Like demographically speaking, Gen X has never mattered. They're too small of a generation to count for anything. Is it because of the millennial title? No, no, it's it, it's just that that birth rate for that group was so low in this country that like the the ones who came of age under Reagan were so like there were just not enough of them demographically to make a difference for voting for any for anything, right? Like it doesn't matter. We're talking economics, po politics, policy, regulate. It doesn't matter. Gen X is too tiny as a demographic to really matter and due to the fact that they came of age under the reagan administration they checked the fuck out and i never fault them for that no judgment i too <laughs> I would just true. i too would just check the fuck out are you kidding me i'm gonna go over here i'm gonna do my <laughs> job i'm gonna try and buy a house and i'm gonna just check the fuck out of society y'all can that's fuck how, off. that's how i really feel so yeah i i yeah yes match i match that gen x is they checked out and i don't blame them but they're not a part of the conversation either because of that very reason. Okay. So the thing about generational windows is I never completely understand what the window time frame is. It depends who's measuring it specifically. Exactly. But like okay, at the so end, we'll just alleviate the next year. Right. Yeah. Um, but like millennials are the most progressive generation we've ever seen. Yeah. Like across the board. Um, the living through it. We, we, um, the, one of the most interesting, um, uh, large, uh, large N, so large study group, large N studies, um, that we saw come out in the last couple of years, um, it was, um, that the most progressive individual in our society across all ideological philosophical, uh, points that were measured is a 45 year old white Democrat identifying male. Do you have a name? Uh, for the study or for like... Oh, you're talking about... Okay, I get you. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. That, yeah. Is, that is the most progressive group. 
They are for. I, I guess it kind of makes sense having grown up through the decades that I have. They are and, more progressive than the women. They are they more readily identify with feminist positions and ideologies than the women. It is it is staggering how progressive a forty five year old white Democrat identifying male in this country is, and that's a center point, right? Like that's a sort of a center point for that group, and then you end up with people like me that one aren't going to answer that study and two <laughs> right and two like are you know absolutely like yeah burn it what yeah yeah burn it to the ground it's all bullshit fuck it like fuck this entire system it's it's broken there's a re radical seconding oxford english dictionary definition fundamental or systemic change especially that within a political system there's a reason the channel's called proudly radical right uh I, I want the word back. I am proudly radical. I think the system is fundamentally flawed and I think it needs fundamentally altered, right? I'm not, uh, I am unabashed in that matter, but I'll take baby steps too. Any progress is progress. Um, I'm not nuts, but like the millennials are the most progressivist generation. Zoomers, while they have problems, right? Well, they all have problems. They have problems. Point, yeah. Um, they trend towards eco-fascism. That's true. They trend, the males trend towards some more conservative, misogynistic positions. Well, I think it has to do with like the masculinity prospect that they were like, I guess, grown up with. There's a whole host of like comorbidities on yeah. that diagnosis. Um, <laughs> yes. Work. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Andrew Tate. Exactly. Um, <laughs> fucking like right but all in all right they are more progressive than gen xers and combined gen z and millennials compared to boomers might as well be like red flag waving communists right like they are the opposite and so at this point if we want to do anything the wealth is held by boomers. Gen X got a decent share of it. Not, an, not a significant share, but they got a decent share. Um, but the wealth is held by boomers. The power positions are held by boomers. The, the, the seats of power are held by boomers. And they refuse to fucking die. They refuse to retire. They refuse to move on. And we see that within our presidential candidates. We said, dude, fucking take your pick. <laughs> I don't care which side of the op. Fucking these people are goddamn no, I, fucking ancient. I, are you kidding me? Like, that's the point. Like, are you fucking, like, go away. You don't. Like, JFK was the last, like, like I guess you could say, like, age-relevant yeah. person that we had that, like, took the presidential stage. Yeah. And we I, saw what happened with him. I think, it, I think honestly, you want, a, you want a real fucking test, right? Here's a brand new fucking cell phone. Take your pick. iPhone doesn't matter to me. Here's a brand new iPhone. Seeing as they're all boomers, it's probably iPhones. So it, here's a brand new iPhone. Clean install. I'm going to need you to connect it to your account, set up your email, and send me an email. If you, you can't can, call your grandson. If you cannot do this task without calling for a friend. There it is. Then you cannot hold office. This is, like, this is like right. not being able to write a letter. Because what we're talking about, that simple task means to be congruent with like yes. not just modern technology, but with what's happening modernly, right? So if you can't even get the simplest of like fastest that happen to be a modern staple to modern society, how do we trust you to, I don't know, deal with uh, would, modern would, political like uh, hot talking points or even international? Would things? we allow a person who is f illiterate, cannot read or write to be president, Right. That's the sort of conversation we're having is you are illiterate. So at a point we need to just like, yeah, it's like you are not qualified. You don't know how to even send an email, let alone set up an email, right? Like you are not qualified. This is how we get fucking Congress people asking about, it's a series of tubes, and well, what happens if we station too many service members on Guam? Might the island tip over? 
Oh shit! I can't believe. Yeah, so I read about that maybe like six months ago. That was a real fucking comment. Yeah. That oh yeah. Me. Like you, they're not these people. I'm sorry. Like I'm not advocating like IQ testing into Congress, but like at a certain yeah. point, there needs to be like a base recognition that these are important positions, and motherfuckers are dumb as rocks. Yeah, the criteria needs to be sort of funneled down a little bit at this point. Like, <laughs> proxy, thanks for the sub. Ooh, Bezos bucks. Um, yeah, like I, I firmly agree that it's it's broken. Like again, like there's this is this is sort of like anarchist, like behind the scenes in fighting territory. Like um, the likes of like Emma Goldman, I mean, name checked her either. There's uh, uh, earlier. There's people that like would condemn me as an anarchist for even engaging in this conversation. There's the sort of the hardline anarchist position that any uh, any involvement in statist activities is a uh, is a recognition or uh, an endorsement of statist activity, and therefore the only like ethical solution is to blah 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 blah. Right. Um, um, whereas the, the, the pragmatic, modern, common anarchistic position is there's no ethical consumption under capitalism on yet you do it. So you recognize that there are unethical things that you are forced into doing by the circumstances of birth. And one of those is engaging in a neoliberal, neoliberal capitalist system. So you were, you were fine dealing with this amount, but it was that extra step that you took exception with. So shut up. Go vote for your local city council, and that may be that you can set up a food, not bombs, and feed some homeless people without getting arrested, right? Like, you f Yo, maybe. fucking morons, right? Um, so, like, yeah, I'm, I'm in that uh, other camp of, like, yeah, look, I, would I, would I, do I actively advocate for the, like, actual, like, disempowerment of the system utilizing grassroots methodologies? Oh, yes, you better believe your fucking sweet ass I do, but... <laughs> Like, you know, I also recognize uh, humans are not in mass ready for that. We're miseducated, no. diseducated, propagandized, riding through Separated. basic emotional fear, hate programs. We're it, like, it, it's a, it's a progress thing. It's a, it's a project. Right. Um, but ultimately like, yeah, at the very least, could we get the crypt keepers out of Congress? Like, Not if we keep voting for him. That's kind of the point. I I, I mean, it, I, I I laughed my ass off. One of our community members, um, after the first Mitch McConnell blue screen. Oh uh, shit. Um, so one of our community members immediately goes, and Kentucky will be like four more years. Sure enough, after that, he went to a fucking rally in Kentucky, and they were chanting his name. They're like, yeah, Mitch, Mitch, Mitch. You're like, you people are fucking dumb. Because, again, it's this power dynamic. It's the fact that they're afraid if they're incumbent, which incumbents are in an inherently powerful position, right? Running against an incumbent is an uphill battle. Everybody knows this dynamic, right? Yeah. They're afraid if they relinquish their longtime incumbent and their power player in Congress that a Democrat may get in. Well, that's kind of the proof of the pudding because the DNC had 19 people on the uh, preliminary and then somehow we got Biden. I, I can't imagine it because we had four women on that ticket and that's kind of what people were screaming about, especially on the left. Uh, let's get a woman on the fucking ticket. So we had four of them, but all the votes for all four of those women didn't even uh, conclude 25% of the overall ballot or overall voting for them. Just... I to bring up the conspiracy prospect of it, how does that happen? 19 individuals on the DNC ballot, four of them women, and then we get Biden. And then, yeah, um, I get questioned about my. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, we don't. Conspiracy I don't trust the DNC <laughs> after what they did to Bernie. Just straight or up. the N. Yeah. Or the RNC. Or I mean, yeah, I I don't trust Republicans. Is I don't trust anybody who would. I, again, if you call yourself a Catholic after all the shit the Catholics got up to. The Inquisitions. I, Sure, let's go with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a start, right? Right, I like I take your fucking pick, right? Exactly, right? Like it, it is. Well, that's not what's happening now. Well, at a certain a point, history. you gotta stop identifying with these groups. That, like, thank you. You know, you have to be like, uh, look, did I vote Democrat? Yeah, because God help us if Trump gets four more years, right? Like that's this is straight. This is straight. Just. 
casualty I, control. I, this is <laughs> fucking like, I'm just trying desperately to stop the hemorrhaging. Like, that's it. That's it. But I mean, not that Biden was much better because the Look, reason why I couldn't believe that he got off the, the DNC ballot is when he voted in the Iraq war, what was it 94? I, we saw him as a war voter and a war profiteer, but somehow that was like the, uh, the collective democratic mindset to get him. On well, the, uh, again, off, like, off the like I said, I, I I, again, it. in no way, shape or form. Do you know how many people, the, the most common vote in that election was against Trump? Not for what do you Joe mean, like Biden. A vote blue, no matter who thing. Or? Yeah, not ju- not for Joe Biden. Nobody voted. Like very few people voted. Oh, so you mean just for, a preliminary? So I get that. Okay, okay. For Joe Biden, they voted against Trump. Well, there's a point, right? Like that's there. That's that's the whole thing. Nobody really wanted Joe Biden. It was, can this fucking crypt keeper of crypt keepers fucking get elected versus this douchebag? Probably. So f- fuck it, right? We got fucked every, every, the, 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 uh, sort of the, the organizations, the powers that be fucking screwed us here, 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 and here. We end up with this douchebag. But, yeah. Do, yeah. It, these two douchebags, here's your choice. Right, right. Yeah. A piece of shit, or what was it? South Park's of the best. yeah, turd, turd sandwich versus something. Yeah, right. Thank you. Um, but like at the end of the day, as like you know, a gay anarchist leftist in America, seeing how Trump is empowering right wing f- conservative theocratic neo fascists. Right. It is also very much a masculine individual that proclaims his masculinity. Yeah. F- fucking like that dude. That dude had to go. He had to go. Yeah. Like I didn't vote. four more years of that would have been catastrophic. Yes. Like that, that's a whole thing. I mean, it, it just, I mean, outside of all of that, the Chinese tariffs and not understanding what tariffs are. Oh shit. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to develop right. or delve into it, but right. thank you for bringing it up. Can, 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 can we, we, we don't even understand what tariffs are territory. Like it's a tax on us, moron. It's a tax on us. It, it, it funnels like exports. Like we don't get to export as much as we did because of those tariffs. Like, so who does it really hurt? Like you fucking, he just screwed us over and over and over again and fucking, and rural bumfuck nowhere. He's helping us. It's like, everything's so goddamn expensive. I can't sell my soybeans. It's like, oh God. I was going to say the same farmers that voted for him now pay the price for that vote. Yeah. Yeah, they're fucking, it's, I, I, yeah, just that is exemplary of his fucking administration. Tariffs that they don't even understand. It's a tax on us. Like, oh my God, people. It, yeah, so, like, yeah, it was just, it was pure harm reduction. It was pure harm reduction. And it was just like, oh, fuck it. Like, you know, but yeah, would I, would I love to have, like, fucking, I, he's old as shit now. I'd put Bernie in there in a heartbeat. Would he get anything? Yeah. Would he get anything done? No. Yeah, he didn't even move up on that DNC vote. In fact, like Liz Warren got 19% of the vote, which I was, I guess you could say, surprised about. But even at 19% of the vote, I'm like, why wasn't that triple that? Because that's exactly what like people were asking for, put Liz Warren on the ballot. And then just 19%. So how were people dissuaded to vote for Liz Warren and for Joe Biden? And and yes, we're talking about conspiracy theories. And yes, wobbles. (laughs) He would still end up a war criminal. He's it, 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 if the the oh, instant we oh, burn, burning burning um oh, the, the de- no, I don't know no 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 oh. no by definition this is how we operate this around these parts right the moment I think I can the it, yeah. moment you swear in due to the operating apparatus that you are now the legal and because you're intaking what the left the uh, the person left you I guess you you're say. The, the the machine is yours now your name is yeah, on the right. machine. So you're automatically a war criminal the instant you take that oath. The instant. That's a son of a bitch. Fuck yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're just even instantly Ron Paul would have had like if, yeah. if Ron Paul was very much anti-war and I backed him up even even he uh, I had to wear the red sticker because of him uh, in the preliminary. But shit, I mean that that maintains the same uh, same thing. He would stepping into office if he got that office. Liberta- yeah, libertarians, man. We don't tolerate them. Uh, but either yeah. way, um, yeah, no, it is the the, the very apparatus itself is a war crime it's a crime against humanity 
right? It is absolutely. You are in charge of the prisons. You are in charge of the CIA. You are in charge of the military. Despite all of that, like, you know, it, it, including all of that stuff, the moment you do that swearing in ceremony, congratulations, you're a war criminal. Well, they know what they walk into. Or yeah. they wouldn't take that seat. Um, so, like, that's just how it works. Um, and, like, would he have gotten anything done? Absolutely not. Are you kidding me? The force, the money that would have rallied into Congress by all of the financiers, all of the corporations. Yeah, big, say it louder for the people that backed Bernie for, like, what, 20 years now that actually believe that he would have presented a more socialistic uh, presence to the United States. No, he, he would just fall under the same guise as everybody well, else. Well, no, no, no. He, I, I truly, like, I, he, he, you can't single-handedly do anything. Like that's that's the trick, right? And I mean that's kind of my point, right? Like there's there's no like I'm gonna go in there and do this or that. Fucking the Supreme exactly. Court's on the take, dude. Like like when Obama's like I'm gonna close down Guantanamo Bay. Well, that never fucking happened. Uh, there's a reason why. You yeah, can't just well, say things and then have them happen. It doesn't work more, that yeah. way. Like it's exactly. just it's set up to be a machine. There's no way to just put the brakes on it. And you're just a face at that point. Yeah, it, you are. You're a brand. You're a label that they get to switch out and maintain yeah. some sort of like moral integrity because the last guy was whatever, right? <laughs> whatever, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so like, yeah, it, you bring a tone and depending on who you're aligned with, then you can definitely do some damage. That's right? exactly it. Whoever you're aligned with, right, as far as like – ideologies or whatever you uh compensate as far as like morals and virtues right that's why i keep talking about like politics uh being like people take it like it's a sport right so red team blue vote. team red team blue team exactly they'll put up their pom-poms and cheer for whatever team that they're a part of and then like when somebody has a, der a derogatory event happening and it collides with like say if they're a democrat and it's a democrat individual and they do something derogatory they'll just sweep it under the rug like they won't like do anything to get that person out of power or put them in a position where they need to pay for that crime. Right. They're always focused on like red individuals. It's the same thing for the fucking conservatives. They just focus on like blue individuals doing the crimes. Like I don't need to specific, uh, specific, uh, specifically bring up like uh specific uh, things that are happening currently. We'll just say that we understand what's happening, but uh, it just seems like, wouldn't you want to get like the people that are a part of your team, if that's what you consider it, out of your fucking team when they're doing derogatory things, right? But it just seems like they sweep it under the rug and they go, it, it, it's just basically, uh, how would I put it? Just because they think it's a sport, they want to protect the people that's underneath their team. And I'll never understand it, which is why I kind of like, I consider myself like center. I just take myself like out of that political spectrum as far as like red or blue. Uh, I, I think it's because I don't like specifically I don't trust politicians and really when I meet people that are super politically influenced I tend not to trust them either I mean, that influence runs very deep um, sorry for my tangent there, no, but, no 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 yeah. no um, I'm just, uh, just making keeping an eye on chat um, no you're good I can take a social cue you're good um, I also know that you want to do the movie, so if we're running late, you can always say, "Hey, shut up, let's go." Uh, well, I was uh, I was gonna wind it down, but that's fine. Um, but like, um, yeah, no. Ultimately, this is why I'm super grateful for um, one being born in Vermont, two being born to a mother who had me listening to Arlo and Woody Guthrie at age, you know, nothing to when I can remember being four in the car, like singing to Alice's restaurant. Right. <laughs> um, That's cute. Three, her putting me on a mainframe terminal at a hospital at age four. Um, so and growing up in IT, which gave me exposure to the rave scene and the punk music scene. Amen. That reinforced those Vermont anarchist ideals that taught me de the power of decentralized networks via IT, that taught me the power of distributed networks via, I uh, via IT. That Wait, did you get an IT degree? I have to ask. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, management and information systems. I was network systems administration. Okay. Um, Copy, go ahead. 
but so like, yeah, I, I'm versed in information systems theory. Um, and so like, you know, uh, fucking cybernetic theory is definitely a place of exploration that people need to understand that it's not just like, Oh, that's robots, right? No, that isn't what that is at all. Um, and so like those sorts of things reinforced and feedback loop into all of these other things that I did. And then by the early twenties, I'm an Occupy organizer and, you know, through a whole host of things, I end up, you know, doing this where I can fight trolls, um, but also um, occasionally have a decent conversation, which is what I'm going to file this under. Um, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. So, like, uh, congratulations on getting past the welcome screen. Um <laughs> You would not be, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. It actually, it's got a very high reliability rate for us at this point. You would be surprised. Um, Have you had some real problems come on the mic first time? And you, yeah, They generally don't make it to the mic. The, the welcome screen actually usually takes them out. It's, it's surprising how effective just click the button is. Um, yeah. But like, yeah, I, I value these types of moments so i thank you for one having the balls to come on the air um and yeah it i mean it, it definitely has its sort of like nervousness within it but i mean i used to stream plus i used to be a mod for a couple of other channels so it's like yeah just man up and get a spine whatever happens so, happens so it, 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 it collaterally thank you for not making it as politically heavy as i expected to be i do appreciate that i you know i, I it did get there but not as much as i thought I, you know, yeah, I, 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 I'm a halfway decent rhetorician, so I know how to draw something out of somebody usually. But uh, not to the point of like nailing somebody up against the wall. Oh no, I'll absolutely crucify a fucker on the air if, uh, if they deserve <laughs> it, but you don't deserve it. Fair, fair. Like, yeah, there's nothing you... I kind of agreed with coming on. Right? Yeah, there's no transgression here. I've had actual, like actual, like white supremacist, neo-Nazi types on air before. Like, How long did they last? Um, well, the the one I'm thinking of specifically ended up rage quitting when I pointed out that his lord and savior who he worshipped was a Jew. So when you rage quit a conversation, especially with your platform, it's definitely um, – how would I put it? Uh, I, I can't think of the exact word to explain it, but I think we could all feel the consciousness of the emotion that – connection with that yeah. um is not a good look on you and not just for you but like whatever connotation you're trying to present within your conversation uh when people duck out of a conversation that way you're just kind of proving that you're the fallacies run deep within whatever you're talking about yeah he 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 actually believed that um black people had never invented anything white people were responsible for peanut all, butter um all uh, of refrigeration all of the creations um of the modern world he took credit for all of them despite being a community college dropout um, Wait, he, t he, he oh yeah yeah he, he is a white man he bears like equal salve like <laughs> deserving of praise right he is he could get fucked <laughs> yes uh based on some other shit other white people did right um <laughs> Or in some cases, what other black people did. And he, you know, he believed that we needed to live our lives by the Bible, that Jesus was our Lord and Savior. And when I pointed uh, out that Jesus was a rabbi and a Jew, he rage quit. So as a fundamentalist, he couldn't even deal with the fundamentals. Yes. Wow. That's good shit. Yeah, it, it, it helps being like, I've got a cheat sheet of, you know, biblical passages and stuff. I, I always enjoy a good theological conversation, especially, you know, as a minister. It's like, okay, let's do this. Really? You want to talk about this? Okay, let's do let's right. it. And remember, based on the Bible, my word means more than yours. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have magic powers. Um, so yeah, those are always, those are always fun conversations uh, to have with those types. It's like, you really, and really, I'm sorry I missed this? <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, thanks for hanging out, dude. I, I hope you Absolutely. stick around, hang out in the community. Um, we're going to watch, uh, David, J uh, David Parker, uh, Donald James Parker fucking, um, he's infamous for the Gramp series in which his r hyper religiosity, um, bleeds through just about everything. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's told women to like, 
cover their uh, uh, cover their what is it uh, their treats or their fucking lures or whatever like you know you fucking have to cover up with a jacket it's a whole this is a penis thing he's he's nuts man their jewels cover your jewels yes okay I can't um, wait to watch <laughs> and so he's um, he's a special type of dude who like makes all of these movies it's Chris inevitably Christian propaganda and that's the pickleball princess movie we're gonna be watching oh so that's the absolute context behind this it's a pickleball sort of movie based on what i can imagine is a sort of 1996 christian i'm gonna make a movie mindset right we've all seen these types of movies right yeah oh yeah it, it is it, it, he, yeah. he's got an entire unit the gramp cinematic universe right like it is oh yeah it's a You're whole thing kidding me. no 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 this dude's prolific Right, he's got a ton of movies, and we've watched a bunch of them. And I may or may not have stalked him to the point of knowing exactly where his house is. Anyway, <laughs> may or may not. <laughs> um, I'm going to make a kick account so I can watch this movie. With you it, guys. it is, yeah. You're, you know, if you if you want to like, if you want to actually, we do like uh, do mystery science theater three thousand thing. We uh, we will you will oh, see us perfect. in we will see you will see us on Discord. We will be shitting on this movie. Um, but it's uh kicked off. Somebody, why do I not have yeah, a command for? Because I just I just googled kick um something and it just gave me home shop kick I don't know what the fuck that is so something more specific okay right. there we go link is in uh, chat right now it's um it, it, but it's bad movie night is the account all right appreciate that yeah I'll definitely show for that and uh I'll go ahead and dip out thank you for having me on and I'm glad that we had a uh, very civil and very funny uh series of uh conversations here Rob it's been a pleasure I I look forward definitely to future man. conversations. All right, man. I'll see you in kick. Later.